Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, in fact, uh, this is my third week. I've been here since the beginning of October. And uh, th this trimester program is really fantastic and I accomplished so much. This month has been the most productive month of this year, in fact, so it's really fantastic. And in fact, so I'm going to talk about how to do three by two point analysis. And so we have uh, Galaxy Galaxy Auto published in Android et al., the SDSD Auto published in Boliet et al., SD Tumas Cross published in Machia et al. And uh, so this already shows you that how much effort you have to put into to do the proper three by two point analysis. And um, in fact, a lot of them I'm going to talk about are very, very related to what Eric just talked about for intensity mapping. If you swap SZ with intensity mapping, we're do talking about pretty much the same thing. So I hope that uh, uh, you, you hear things again and uh, hope uh, things will become a lot more clearer uh, for this particular approach. But uh, because I really, however, have to say that I'm very proud that I can accomplish so much that I want to talk about uh, this another topic if I have any time left. Uh, so this was papers completed during the, this trimester program. So I'm really grateful to the, this uh, program here. So uh, I put that into the acknowledgement of my paper. So I uh, hope uh, uh, program officers will, will like it. And this, again, is in fact very much related to what Eric talked about. And I hope uh, there's a synergy between CMB community and the intensity mapping community for foreground cleaning. And we, I think we can put together everything within the same Bayesian framework. So uh, I think that would be quite a useful thing to do. So uh, what is a two point, uh, uh, three by two? So essentially, uh, for many, many uh, years, uh, for many, many papers, when we mean by joint constraints is in fact you take auto power spectrum of CMB, auto power spectrum of large scale structure, and then put them on the likelihood, ignoring the correlation between them. In this case, you have this uh, green is CMB combined with BAO, and then uh, red is CMB combined with H0, and luckily CMB and BAO and CMB and H0 are not very much correlated, therefore it makes sense to do this way. But when the uh, data sets do have correlations in them, you, you have to include them. You can't just ignore them. There's information in there, and that there's a uh, lot of things that you, that's quite useful. So, but, uh, so joint analysis, in a way, you know, everybody knows, uh, you, you have the data. Given the data, you want to get posterior for the parameters. And, um, but uh, in many cases, what people do is to just multiply the posteriors of individual data sets, but never the correlation, or well, almost, you know, uh, rarely, <laughs> rarely the correlations. So what I'm, all, I'm saying is basically fairly trivial. Uh, when you try to do the uh, parameter estimation given the data sets, you do the joint all data sets. And that's uh, the, the uh, philosophy of three by two point analysis, and uh, so you have spec LSS, imaging LSS, doing lensing, and you have CMB, and there are all sorts of physical ways that uh, this cross-correlation should arise. So you just can't ignore them. Uh, so uh, this terminology was popularized by Dark Energy Survey, which I very much like it. I'm not a part of the, the survey team, so I think uh, I can say that uh, I like it, and uh, it's not a political thing. So uh, you have uh, autocorrelation of weak lensing and autocorrelation of galaxies and cross-correlation of galaxy and lensing. And these are all papers part of the uh, dark energy survey first year results. And you see that uh, each measurement has to come with uh, uh, a person in charge of it. So it shows you again how hard it is to actually do it, but you should do it, okay? I think that's the key, key message from the DES collaboration, which I very much agree with. So when you have the lensing auto, you get green. And when you have galaxy auto and galaxy lens cross, you get red. And then when you combine them all, you get blue. But uh, for many uh, years, I think uh, we, we just had galaxy auto combined with lensing auto without cross between them. So uh, this is the major step forward. Why cross correlation? Why do we care even? And uh, uh, let me just argue that there are two signal to noise regimes where the power of cross correlation becomes apparent and then third, would be the uh, sort of physical reasoning. So let's start with tracers X and Y, and you have XX, YY, and XY cross correlations. When X has a very high signal to noise, but Y has very low signal to noise, but you know that there's a signal in common. Then 
you can show that XY is always more powerful than YY. Noisy auto. Sort of the things you already heard from Eric, but let, let's, uh, give, let me give you the additional example. So this is the temperature power spectrum from WMAP. Very, very high signal to noise. But when you go to the E mode power spectrum, it's pretty noisy. But then you cross correct them, you get a huge signal out of it. What's going on here, right? So suddenly you're in a situation where EE auto is pretty much useless, but the TE cross is so much more powerful. So let's look at the covariance. You have the, uh, covariance, the variance of the TE cross correlation written that way. And then when the T is signal dominated, so you ignore the uh, TT noise, which is N sub L TT. And then you are noise dominated in E, therefore you ignore CL EE compared to N sub L EE, that's the noise power spectrum of E. You get this formula. Then signal to noise of the TE is essentially uh, signal square, so CLTE square divided by that term here uh, in the middle. That, so you get this signal to noise of TE square that's given by that formula, and you have signal to noise of EE given that formula. Take that ratio, take that ratio, and then you discover that uh, um, you have CLTE in the top divided, CLTE square in the top divided by CLTT and CLEE, that's so-called cross-correlation coefficients, and you have NLEE divided by CLE. That's a signal to noise, what well, noise to signal ratio for the EE. We just said that uh, uh, EE is noise dominated, so that's much greater than one. And uh, the reason why you want to cross-correlate them is that there's a cross-correlation in there, <laughs> right? To begin with, therefore this cross-correlation coefficient is less than one, but not much less than one. Then you always get a higher signal to noise for uh, TE. Therefore, uh, this shows you that uh, cross-correlation is very powerful when you have a noisy data. You, you, you wrote the grant proposal to get that data, GBT, for example, and you end up with noise. But you know that there's a signal in there. Now, how could I get signal out of it? How do I get cream out of it so that I can get science out of it or I can apply for additional grant? Cross-correlation, either way. And, uh, so uh, uh, when you have noisy data, let's say fashionable things are stochastic gravitational waves, it's noise. But if you have the uh, very, for example, local galaxy distribution such as two mass redshift survey, just cross correlate and you might get signal out of it. Right? So that's the way. I mean, cross correlation is very powerful in getting uh, maximize the science output of very noisy data. Now, uh, when you have the X and Y, which are both high signal to noise, then cross correlation does not usually add that much more statistical power, except the case I'm going to talk about next, but uh, let's say, usually so. But then this is very useful because cross correlation will then often nail the nuisance parameters. No, they do not necessarily constrain cosmological parameters directly because their statistical power is often limited, but that they help nail junk. You know, they help sort of fix the uh, problems, uh, known unknowns. You know some effects are there, like intrinsic alignment of uh, weak lensing. You nail that by cross-correlating the uh, galaxies and lensing. So this is, there's a usefulness in there uh, as well, not just statistical power. But then the real power is a tomography. So when you have the uh, signal map Y, which contains the signal integrated over all rest shifts, but then you have, the, let's say, uh, like a spectroscopic galaxy samples from SDSS, within a certain redshift ranges, you cross correlate and you get signal out within that redshift range. So that's tomography. And that's the real power of that. And I'm going to show you one example where Y is the uh, map of the scenario Zeratovich effect. You can also do mass tomography. You, when you cross correlate your map that contains all the masses or all the fluxes or all anything, and you cross correlate, there is some samples with known characteristics, like a known range of masses, known range of uh, star formation rates, anything. Then cross correlation will give you tomography on pretty much anything you want. So, for example, when you have, uh, this is not what I'm going to do. In reality, we'll just take the Fourier transform of one map, Fourier transform of another, cross-correlate, you know, very simple thing. But a lot of people like 
stacking. So I just wanted to give you this intuitive example of stacking. Let's say Y maps at the locations of galaxies. So you stack the Compton Y map or Y map at the location of galaxies, uh, ith galaxy, and uh, some of all galaxies. You subtract the mean. You, let's rewrite this in a fancy way by using Dirac delta, so that mathematically they're equivalent. But then in a continuous limit, you, uh, what you typically do is to replace Dirac delta by the number density of galaxies. So it's, that's an equivalent thing. Dirac delta has the uh, one over volume units, so that's the density. Then you plug that in and then integrate, and what you end up with is this formula. So this shows you that the stacking is mathematically completely equivalent to two-point correlation function cross cross two-point correlation function, right? So when you hear somebody saying uh, stacking is, is uh, uh, something doing something different from cross, and that's completely wrong. So, uh, but this, this, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, this cross correlation coefficient, cross correlation power spectrum, cross correlation function is related to cross power spectrum through the uh, Bessel transform. So, uh, so that's how you uh, might do cross correlation uh, uh, through stacking as well. Okay, so let me uh, start talking about senior Zerodovich effect. Uh, there's a galaxy cluster buried in this uh, image, and uh, what you typically do is to look for red galaxies because for the reasons that we don't understand, uh, galaxy clusters tend to contain red galaxies. There are red galaxies over here, they're red. And if you go to the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, you get a sharper image, you go to X-ray, you get booming signal coming out of you because this is proportional to density squared. If you go to microwave, uh, you get hole. So negative flux compared to the background, uh, the uh, background of CMB. This is the senior Zerodovich effect. By the way, I want to show off this image because this is the first image of the SZ taken by Arma. This is the highest sensitivity image ever taken. You look at the units. I never used in my life micro Kelvin, uh, micro Jansky uh, in radio images. This is just so fantastic. Uh, people might associate ALMA with the angular resolution. That's true, but uh, for, for diffusion emission like that, sensitivity is just really tremendous. Uh, so really, really thank uh, so for the first time, SZ image resolution is matching up with the uh, resolution of the X-ray. So we can do lots of things with that, um, which I'm happy to talk to you about if you uh, are interested. All right, so Senior Zerodovich effect. Uh, when the photons from the last of certain surface, the CMB photons, come to us, they experience two things. One is diffraction by gravitation, uh, gravitation lumps, the matter uh, lumps in the universe. So this is the gravitational lensing. That's the top thing. Bottom thing is when the CMB photons hit hot gas in the galaxy cluster, then their uh, energy is Compton upscattered. And then low, in the low frequency, therefore, there's a dip deficit in the uh, flux. In the higher frequency, you have the increment. So, so there's a clear, very unique frequency spectrum which you can use to uh, subtract, which you can use to uh, discriminate between SZ and the other things to create a map of the SZ. So multi wavelength data, this already shows you that you can do cross correlation, right? So you can do cross correlation between SZ and X-ray, you can do cross correlation between optical, X-ray, optical, SZ, everything. Uh, so then you create, so Planck Corporation has done a beautiful job creating this uh, full sky thermal pressure map because the SZ is the integral of the line of sight integral of the electron pressure. That's a full sky map of the uh, pressure. And uh, you can count these objects and then do cosmology with it. It's a typical number count business, but you can also take entire thing and treat it as an intensity mapping. You know, that, that's, the, that's the intensity mapping you just heard about. Let's do intensity mapping then, but there's no ratchet information here. So it's a, a kind of application limited, but then here comes the two mass. So you have this uh, beautiful full sky map of the galaxies, a very local uh, universe. So you can now do uh, tomography of the full sky thermal pressure map in the local universe. That's what the cross correlation will give you, and then you detect it, the cross correlation, that's a cross power spectrum, done by Ryu Makia, uh, 
uh, my post uh, got covered by mu, and uh, this uh, dot dash is the uh, best fitting two header term, dash is the best fitting one header term, and you quickly realize that, uh, I tell you what that means later, you quickly realize that this cross power is completely dominated by one header term. Not the typical regime you are in, uh, but this is very interesting. Uh, all right, but what do we learn from this? You can't learn anything from this, in fact, unless you use auto, <laughs> okay? So let's use auto. So there we need full three by two. Uh, so here is the uh, auto power spectrum of the two mass register survey. Uh, in fact, despite that these two mass maps are so popular, uh, I looked at the literature very hard and we couldn't find any auto power spectrum of two mass register survey. <laughs> And uh, uh, so we decided to measure this ourselves. And we submit a paper, referee said, you know, this can't be new. Uh, and, uh, but then we agreed that it actually this is new. Okay? So this is the two mass auto power and led by Sinitro Ando in Amsterdam. And uh, interestingly, you have only 40,000 galaxies over the full sky, yet you detect power at all angular scales. This means uh, two, mass map, two mass map is so highly clustered, so nonlinear. Essentially, most of the galaxies are bunched into groups and clusters far from Gaussian distribution. So we need to include the four-point function, the tri-spectrum, in the covariance. Otherwise, you get wrong answer. And there are many nuisance parameters. Nuisance for us may not be nuisance for others, but uh, uh, that you need to take into account. So you have the three-dimensional galaxy power spectrum that you model, and you project this into the seas of Ls using the galaxy number counts, uh, that's W. Then uh, you have the clustering of two galaxies inside one big halo cluster, that's one halo term. And then you have two halo term, two galaxies living in two distinct halos. This is subdominant, so I'm not gonna talk about it. The first term contains this thing, you know, this NSAT, M, that's basically how many satellite galaxies do you have per halo for a given mass. And you have U sat, that's how galaxies populate the number density distribution of galaxies inside of a halo, the radial profile. And we don't really know them. Therefore, you just fudge them, you know, just assume something and then just deal with it. That's a typical approach. You have five nuisance parameters and you marginalize over them, but you use a nasty, nasty degeneracy among them, who, you know, but who cares, we're just marginalized, you know, pretending that the, what we're doing actually makes sense, which you can question. Then you can get uh, uh, this result, and it's a nice fit. Sure, it's a nice fit because uh, we have so many parameters, but then one thing you realize is that uh, most of the power is coming from galaxy clusters. Uh, where you, if you add the uh, galaxies living inside of the halo greater than 10 to the 14 solar masses, you basically account for most of the signals. This shows you that the two mass is a fantastic tracer of SZ or X-ray. I mean, you, you see lots of X-rays, uh, known galaxy clusters in the two mass catalog anyway. And, uh, uh, but why should we believe this? You know, this uh, so many nuisance parameters. Do they even make sense? Now, uniqueness of Lozy survey like two mass is actually fantastic because uh, we actually see nuisance parameters in sky. Let's say, what are the nuisance parameters? Nuisance parameters are how the galaxies distribute within the halo and how many galaxies are there per halo. We can resolve them because it's two mass. You know, you see gigantic galaxy cluster in front of you. You just count the galaxies inside the galaxy cluster and there you go. And uh, these distributions of galaxies inside the uh, halos, they match with what we got from the power spectrum analysis. And you can also count the number of galaxies inside of the halo as a function of halo masses from the uh, optical uh, groups and galaxy uh, clusters. These uh, shaded areas are model predictions from our best fitting model fitted to the power spectrum. Points are what we actually counted in the map, and they match up very well. So. Uh, this was really uh, reassuring that, that these uh, nuisance parameters actually do make sense. So uh, we are confident that we actually understand two mass, understand galaxies in the two mass redshift survey datasets. 
Now look at SZ. Now you do take the uh, comp SZ map of the Planck, and then you collect the power spectrum. You can get the power spectrum. It's far from Gaussian again. Therefore, you have to take into account tri-spectrum covariance, which was ignored by Planck team's analysis. Uh, so that leads to some revision of the measurements I will present later. But then we have a bunch of nuisance parameters because when you try to do the comp component separation, you have a CMB map or you have nine frequency bands of the Planck that contains CMB, SZ, radio sources, CIB, uh, other things, correlating noise. Then you component separate, but you can't remove all of them. Therefore, what you observe in the power spectrum is the SZ plus a bunch of other things, which you need to marginalize over. And, uh, uh, but it's not trivial, because if you look at the literature, uh, so Planck team ignore the tri-spectrum, but they marginalize over all new sun's parameters. Uh, Horowitz, Seljak, and Salvati et al. Uh, included the tri-spectrum and covariance, but uh, didn't marginalize over new sun's parameters. And Fourier and Lacas uh, included the tri-spectrum, but uh, not marginalize over new sun's parameters. Instead, they do something else. Uh, so what we decided to do was to just do everything. So we very marginalized of everything, SZ model parameters, all relevant cosmological parameters, because some study only varies sigma i times omega matter to the 0.4 power, but not all other cosmological parameters, and new science parameters with a tri-spectrum in the covariance that depends upon parameters as well. So we do the uh, full analysis. Then what we got was that uh, because, the, uh, because of the interplay between new sun's parameters and uh, uh, main signal, uh, the best fit power spectrum reported by Planck turns out to be a little bit high. And uh, when you do the tri-spectrum and then uh, properly marginalize over the uh, new sun's parameters, the signal became a bit lower, uh, which it turns out that uh, uh, this this was a necessary step to make the result from SE power spectrum agree with the result from the number counts of the detected Sinead Zorovich cluster, uh, uh, clusters. So uh, I think this, this was a useful fix to the, to the analysis. And uh, now, uh, why does the power spectrum look the way it does? Uh, it's very simple. So this is L square CL, usual stuff. Look at the CL. When you have a bunch of delta functions and you measure power spectrum, what you measure is just a flux square divided by 4 pi and add over all the clusters. Easy. And it's delta function, so it's a constant. But then uh, clusters are not really delta functions. They have the size. So in that case, what you're doing is to add up Fourier transform of the individual cluster profiles square add over uh, all the clusters that you have. And if you multiply this by L square, you get this, so goes up and goes down. And uh, because the uh, big clusters are nearby, they are not only big, but they are nearby, so they subtend huge angles in the sky, therefore their peak occurs at lower multiples. If you go to uh, 10 to the 13 solar mass objects, they are not only small, but they are also abundant in higher rest shifts. Their peaks shift to the uh, higher multiples, and uh, so in this way, if you add smaller clusters, you go in sort of the uh, top right direction. Everything is understood, and uh, more or less. And uh, so here you go. You have the Fourier transform over the Y map squared, and you add up all clusters. So you integrate over mass, you integrate over volume. But then you need this uh, Fourier transform over the Compton Y map uh, that's proportional to thermal pressure. You need to do something about it. Now, you can totally calculate thermal pressure from first principle, almost first principle. Uh, but uh, here, we decided to sort of use this observed profile from the Planck collaboration. Now, when Planck collaboration measured uh, pressure profiles by stacking the uh, SC signals on the individual clusters, uh, they have to relate that to the mass. The mass comes from X-ray measurements, assuming hydrostatic equilibrium which is known to be biased. Therefore, but they didn't correct for the bias because we don't know what the bias is. Therefore, in the mass, it's necessary, actually, to multiply the factor to convert what's inside of the Planck pressure profile to the true mass. So let's call that capital B. 
And for the experts, this capital B is related to one minus small b inverse, uh, inverse of one minus small b. For some reason, we decided to call this capital B, but it's the same thing, it's just uh, reciprocal of each other. So basically, uh, from now on, we don't care about cosmological parameters, we only care about this B, okay? Because knowing this is, is uh, important, not only for cosmology, but also astrophysics. And uh, we realized that uh, uh, the summary statistics of the, or well, summary number, the one number that characterizes the amplitude of SZ power spectrum is this capital F, sigma I times omega minus divided by mass bias to 0.4 power, H to the minus 2.2. So we measure this to 2.6%, and this co semi -cos almost cosmos independent. Uh, if you have a neutrino mass, uh, you replace omega matter by the omega cold dark matter plus baryon, and sigma eight of the total matter with sigma eight of the cold dark matter and baryon, and you get the same answer. So this is useful number. If you know mass bias, you can use lots of cosmology with it, okay? It's 2.6% measurement, it's not bad. All right, however, how do we do, how do, we do with uh, this mass bias here, right? It's the nasty thing. But in any case, let's do the joint analysis, then maybe gives us some insight about this mass bias. So this is two mass auto, largely one halo dominated in the small scales. This is SC auto, completely dominated by one halo term. So you're just looking at essentially the uh, clustering inside of halos, one halo. Then that's a cross. So I put them all together, and uh, we'll do the full covariance, including tri-spectrum. Therefore, if you look at the galaxy galaxy, there's a bin tubing uh, covariance, YY, huge bin tubing covariance, GY, the same thing. And then there's a cross covariance uh, in all the data sets. All of these are calculated by theoretical uh, thing. Therefore, we know how these things depend upon cosmological parameters and uh, uh, model parameters and everything else. So it's a full analysis, and you marginalize over everything, and then uh, we get the result. So if you just use the SCD auto, and you now force whatever you get, because the SCD auto depends upon not only the mass bias, but also a bunch of other cosmological parameters. So you say, you ask, what, what mass bias do I need within the framework of flat lambda CDM cosmology constrained by Planck PP, low P, and lensing. The answer is 1.5, okay, so, or uh, it's uh, 0.67 for one minus B, uh, if you're an expert. So, uh, that's good, but uh, is that really believable? You know, we have this correlating noise, you have CIB, you know, that's bullshit, and then, uh, so let's look at the cross. What do I get from cross? And uh, the, yeah, the uncertainty is a bit large, but uh, you get the same answer. So this was reassuring. You actually do get the same answer from SZ auto and cross. Therefore, uh, no obvious systematics for the measurement of the B coming from SZ auto, which I thought was pretty cool. So that's the result. And uh, this mass bias is a bit high in B, a bit low. Uh, you, one minus b, relative to the theoretical expectation. Uh, therefore, there's something interesting going on here. Maybe either we don't understand the cluster astrophysics as much as we thought we did, or uh, there's some cosmological implication, okay? The jury is still open. Now, we can do mass tomography also, because uh, this is a mass dependence. If you look at the L of 10, 100, 1,000, you are primarily essentially dominated by the uh, very massive halos, uh, 10 to the 15 solar masses. So that's what SC auto is giving you. But if you do the cross, then you actually suddenly become more sensitive to lower mass halos. So in this way, by cross-correlating the SZ and uh, two mass, you're sensitive to lower mass halos, which allows you to do the mass tomography. So let's write down the pressure as mass to the two-thirds, that's a semi-similar scaling, plus alpha. And you will constrain alpha. And if you only use uh, auto, which is red, you can't really constrain because it's degeneracy between uh, slope over the mass, mass slope and the bias. And if you get auto, uh, cross only, then you don't really get the constraining power, but if you combine them, you, you determine the uh, mass slope, which is consistent to zero. So, so similar scaling appears to work quite well. So this was not possible if you used only SZ auto. So this already shows you the power of the cross, giving the tomographic information. So when you have two data sets, just do three by two. It's hard, but uh, it's worth it. 
And uh, it requires good knowledge of the both data sets. But I think that's the era we are in. You, know, you can't just be expert on one thing. You know? Just uh, look, look for the other data sets and be familiar with it and just do the analysis properly and you learn something that you didn't learn before. In the machine learning uh, sessions, we didn't really hear much about cross-correlation. But when you do the pattern, you know, pattern recognitions or you're trying to figure out correlated patterns in there, right? Then cross-correlation is a natural step. So, uh, I mean, a lot of people I've heard, I'm, I'm sure people do this already, but I've heard a lot of machine learning talks specifically for one data sets, but I think uh, there's a lot to be learned, or a lot to be gained, in fact, for teaching machine also to include cross-correlation information as well. The novelty in our analysis, our particular analysis, but we included the full tri spectrum and parameter dependence uh, as well in the covariance, you know, marginalized over everything. And then uh, our analysis revealed mass independence of the mass bias. And also, the, we got consistent answers from mass bias uh, from Orton Cross. And I forgot to say, this mass bias we got is very, very consistent with the mass bias you need to reconcile cluster number counts results with the uh, primary CMB. All right, in fact, I have 10 minutes, yeah? Uh, I'm doing much better than I thought. So uh, <laughs> this is the uh, paper that we finished during this trimester, uh, very proud of that. So uh, on Monday, uh, Jean-Francois uh, gave a very nice talk on CMB uh, foreground cleaning, and uh, he showed something like this, uh, not exactly this map, but uh, this is our uh, version of it. So you take 140 gigahertz map and uh, uh, subtract other frequency channel times alpha. So you remove dust or synchrotron or whatever you want to remove. And you debias CMB by dividing that by one minus alpha. That's a so-called internal template cleaning. It's template because you use dust in the higher frequency as a template. It's internal because you don't use any extra data sets. Okay? So it's the internal template method. And Jean-Francois said this method doesn't assume anything about foregrounds, but uh, yeah, it actually does uh, because unless spectral property of the foreground is uniform over the sky, this method just doesn't work. If you assume that, the, for example, synchrotron spectral index is invariant or uniform over the sky, then this method works. But in reality, synchrotron spectral index varies over the sky. So if you assume that it's constant, you obviously get the biased result. But it's not so bad, actually, because uh, so when we apply this internal template method to futuristic data sets coming from, let's say, Lightbird uh, satellite, you know, it's a simple thing. You know, just uh, take 100 gigahertz or whatever, subtract 240 or uh, 40 gigahertz, multiply by co coefficient. Then you get the bias, sure, but it's only at the level of 2 times n minus 3. I thought, that's not bad. But then the PI of the light bird said, no, 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 no. We need, we need to bring this down to less than 10 minus 3. That's the full success criterion of the light bird experiment. This is, uh, uh, this is the uh, proposal that we put into the JAXA. We are down selected as one of the two competing missions for 2027 launch window. And uh, the final selection, the first stage of the final selection is December this year, in fact, December 20th. And then uh, if we will pass that, then the final selection is March next year. So uh, after March, you see me either completely drunk or, <laughs> uh, or drunk and happy, <laughs> or drunk and really. So yeah, uh, watch out. <laughs> All right, so then we thought we should do better, okay? So uh, what do we do? We, we have the observed polarization Q and U in a frequency nu, which we model as a superposition of a CMB and foreground component. So Q, QF is a foreground emission at frequency nu star, like a 350 gigahertz. We then assume some spectral property to propagate that to the frequency nu. Now this foreground parameter is P, like a beta or dust temperature, should we then infer uh, P's as a function of pixels too? And many people do that, you know, Commander, and uh, there's a huge machinery for that, uh, which we should use, and we are using for light brother studies too, but uh, I thought that um, maybe uh, we 
maybe we should do something else uh, to make prob problem a bit faster and more tractable. So one thing we learned uh, from previous paper is that the bias you get is not so large, uh, which means spatial variation is there, but it's not that huge variation. Therefore, why don't we just tail expand? So we have the mean beta and then perturbation of that, and we tail expand this uh, uh, foreground component. So first term is just mean, and second term is a fluctuation. We truncate at the first order. Then uh, what you end up having is just more foreground templates, but spatially uniform coefficients, right? So when you have, for example, the spatially varying uh, synchrotron, okay, you had synchrotron template, but now you, what you have is a synchrotron template plus synchrotron template times template of the delta B. You don't know what that is, that's okay, uh, because you marginalize over it anyway. Then you have the more coefficient to determine, but this is much better than having to determine coefficient per pixel, right? So you, you increase the degree of freedom by one, but not median, okay? So that's, the, uh, that's good. And, and I don't have time to show the actual plot to show that it works, but it works, okay? So uh, uh, because this is the uh, statistical inference conference, I, I thought that the methodology is more important than the results. So uh, you have to believe that this works, <laughs> and let's go on to the, um, Go on to the methodology. What are we doing here? Uh, what are I or what are we doing? Sounds a bit ad hoc. You know, you have the two frequencies. You have to decide which one is dust channel, which one is synchrotron channel. You have to decide which one is CMB. Isn't that really arbitrary? Isn't that really ad hoc? It is, actually. And uh, surely it's maybe unbiased, but because of this uh, kind of uh, um, manipulations, uh, is it minimum variance, for example? Do we even know what are you doing? And uh, what's the Bayesian foundation for that? And uh, I can answer that now, thanks to the, uh, this trimester program where we have a lot of, made a lot of progress. So let's take the bottom-up approach, okay? Bottom-up, you take two maps and you subtract the two by proper weighting and divide that by the uh, weightings to debias CMB. Nothing but simplest template cleaning, okay? So we know what this, has to give you CMB. CMB. When you have a spatially varying parallel, then you have one more, one more parameter, one more map. Therefore, you need three channels, three frequencies, not two, three to uh, calculate CMB, which you can do trivially. Uh, you just start from this uh, thing here, and then you try to eliminate both QF and delta P times QF. Simple algebra, that's the answer. That's okay. But what are you do? What am I doing here? Is this, is this really has any Bayesian foundation? All right, so let's go there. And uh, I think uh, this is a very useful um, thing to start with. Uh, everybody knows. Everybody working on CMB uh, component separation knows this. But perhaps people in uh, intensity mapping, you know, it's useful to start with this, and then just do the logic and see what you, exactly what you're doing to get the results that you have been using. So what I'm going to now do now is, okay, we got this template cleaning or delta map method to take into account first order and perturbation. Do I, how do I be, derive that from this? Okay, that's the question. So M is a map. D is so-called mixing matrix that uh, Jean, uh, Francois already talked about. This tells you how, for example, synchrotron depends on the frequency. So D decides frequency dependence. D for CMB is one. S is a CMB, dust, synchrotron, or anything else you want. So that's a signal uh, vector, and the N is a noise covariance. Hopefully you know what this is, or maybe in a 21 centimeter case, you don't know what this is. Therefore, you also have to marginalize over somehow, eh? which you can do uh, within this framework. Then you uh, get the maximum likely solution, uh, mixing matrix transpose and inverse, mixing matrix, inverse, blah, blah, blah. Uh, everybody who is working on CMB component separation knows this. But now I take, uh, the number of frequencies and so, such that uh, we have just enough frequencies to separate components. So when we have two components, we need special uniform foreground and CMB. We need two, at least two maps. So if you have two maps, then that's a solution. And this solution agrees with template cleaning. So you can derive template cleaning from the maximum likelihood when the number of frequency channels is just enough to do, get the CMB solution. When you have three maps, when you have a spatially varying 
uh, things, you now have to just expand signal, signal vector to include uh, template times fluctuations in the spectral index. You have more signal vectors, that's okay. Then you get uh, uh, same thing, same formula. Uh, then you get this map as a maximum likely solution. This is what I showed you already, okay? So this, uh, this works. Okay, so what we showed already in heuristic approach, bottom-up approach agrees with maximum likely solution when the number of frequency channels is just enough to solve for one free, uh, CMB map. That's good. But what about posterior, okay? We don't really care uh, what the CMB map is, really, because it's contaminated anyway. What's important is how do we extract like a tensor to scalar ratio of the gravitational waves from inflation out of it. So let's derive in a heuristic way first. So that's bottom up. So I get these two maps with coefficients. So if you just take the uh, square of this and average, you get the covariance. And that covariance will be given by the CMB signal covariance plus uh, enhanced the noise because you are subtract you know, this uh, coefficients, right? So when the uh, noise of uh, M new one and new two are uncorrelated, you get the covariance of each times coefficient square divided by the coefficient uh, difference square. Very, very simple. How do I derive that, okay? So uh, now do it in a top-down way. So likelihood do we know that we, as an implier for CMB, for example, we marginalize over the CMB, everybody knows, uh, and then we get this result in the top. Then now D tilde is the mixing matrix without CMB component because we will marginalize over CMB already. And SF contains only the signal of the foreground. Nothing magical, now what? And in fact, uh, this is really due to the discussion with Ben, and uh, Ben showed me this Flavian Ban uh, Flavian uh thesis in uh, uh, 2014, where he shows that you can pretty much derive all, almost all the foreground removal methods in the literature by simply going from the top and then do something to the SF and capital SF. You marginalize over signal of the foreground, you maximize for the SF, or you marginalize over as covariance of the F, or you parameterize the uh, covariance of F, uh, you name it. And it turns out that what we are doing is to plug in the maximum likelihood solution for foreground into the formula, and that's the result. It looks terrible, but when we have, let's say, uniform spectral index and two frequencies, just enough to solve for one CMB map, we get the result we obtained heuristically, which was not trivial to me at all. So, uh, so essentially, the, the uh, method I'm advocating, which turns out that it gives you the unbiased estimate of the foreground spectral indices, as well as the CMB, uh, is the, uh, this. So um, that's it. And uh, uh, I talked only about the power of synchrotron, but you can do this for uh, Spatially varying synchrotron index, spatially varying synchrotron and curvature, and modified back body dust. And in this paper, we also t show you how to take into account anomalous microwave emission, polarization, also frequency decorrelation in a unified way. So if you're interested, wait for November, or just come talk to me. I'll be happy to share the draft with you. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, thank you for the very enjoying talk. Um, I, I would like to make two comments. Yes. Uh, uh, the idea that you could um, account for uh, specially varying uh, indexes uh, have been uh, already used for, by the people from uh, Cambridge when they were early uh, participants to the component separation paper, so they would uh, take a one column for the black body, uh, sorry, um, that's the emission, plus one column for the derivative of it with respect to temperature, accounting for the... Oh, okay, okay. 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 Um, that's one thing, but w w the other thing which I uh, stressed in my talk was that uh, the only thing that you need really to use if you want to remove the foregrounds is the, is the uh, space spanned by all the columns of the mixing matrix. And you don't even need to, to introduce explicitly derivative in that case. 
uh, a component which varies over the sky, we just be accounted at first order by an extra column, at, at second order by an, another one, and so on. Yeah, yeah, I think what you're saying is that uh, the, the, I learned from your talk was that you can just let me know uh, if I understood it correctly. So, so far, I'm not dividing this foreground component into the components that are orthogonal to CMB and that are not orthogonal. So what you're saying is, if I understood it correctly, you can decompose this space into subspaces and then the one that's orthogonal to CMB, then you don't care about that anyway, right? Then you deal only with the, the foreground components that are not orthogonal to CMB. Is that, uh, no? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Ah, okay, okay. No, no, no. Let, let, let me actually emphasize because, as I said, special variation effect is not large. Yeah. I mean, not large at all. <laughs> so, so if you are not requiring this kind of level of accuracy, you don't need to worry about this thing. Interpretively, you just uh, span linear space and search through that linear space. Sure, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, but instead of to instead of smallness, you just say there's a linear space uh, that captures spectral variations, uh, unknown foreground components that you didn't even know that were there, and so, right. and so forth. And you just let absorb all of that uh, rather than starting from some physical model and and perturbing where you're linearizing anyway. So then, why not just open up a linear space and and absorb everything in a number of components. Yeah, so then I think you, so what, this approach, I agree with you, by the way. This approach, we know how many parameters we need given the physical model. In this case, we don't really know how many parameters, right? So I guess we just keep adding parameters until we get convergence or something. Yeah, 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 I, I agree with you, yes. I had actually two questions, but I leave the second one for coffee. So uh, I want to go back to the first part of your talk. And at some point, yeah, yeah that's plot, the plot that just went through. Just, yeah, this one. So, so this is you know, an example of what could be a nightmare scenario, where you have uh, something for the auto that doesn't agree with something for mm -hmm. the cross. Right. And then <laughs> if you don't go through that step and you just put everything into the wash, you get the nice gray contour and you think you are happy. Well, this is actually telling you something, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, sure. It's giving you additional information, yes. the fact that they don't agree. That's and right. also the fact that they may agree. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct, yes. So do you know what the additional information there is? So, uh, yeah, yeah, we spend uh, quite a lot of time. It's just that uh, it's not apparent here, but this contours really extends, just degeneracy line extends to up. And uh, for some strange reason, um, so that our, our uh, answer would be that uh, it's um, statistical fluctuation. But we, when you look at the uh, <laughs> best fit curve of those, right? somehow this red likes this uh, bottom left a lot, although your eye tells you that it's a bad fit. But because of this uh, non-Gaussian error, uh, it's really doing something funny. And, uh, so although it looks a bit funny in the control level, uh, if you actually look at these uh, plots, then you may judge you know, which one is actually a better fit, although so, so you're not you, supposed to do that. So are you doing <laughs> non-Gaussian error but Gaussian likelihood? We are doing because the non-Gaussian error but the Gaussian likelihood. Because in principle, if you have non-Gaussian error, you also have a non-Gaussian likelihood. That's so that right. may explain what's going on. I don't, I'm know. Not, I don't think so, because I think the uh, likelihood itself is pretty Gaussian, because, the, uh, because we, ha we are really talking about the error of a few hundreds. But, uh, but here, you know, this is preferred. This, this, oh, okay, chi-square value is terrible here. But if we will add the determinant uh, to the likelihood, then these two are equally likely. So if you just look at the chi-square part, uh, you can tell which one's better. 
So again, this comes about the interpretation. You know, when do you include determinant or not? This also depends upon whether you marginalize or something, or you, you only uh, use the maximum likelihood. It's a tricky. <laughs> but yeah, your eye is telling you uh, the correct story. You know what's going on here. Uh, our interpretation is that this blue is probably a, a, a truth. Likelihood including determinant somehow tells you that the red is also like likely, and we have to tell. We have to come up with some another measure to really distinguish between so them. If you were doing mocks, say, so the sort of uh, Monte Carlo way of estimating your likelihood, then that would be sorted. I hope so. Yes. Yes. That. Yes. So that's all okay. Uh, but then you said you actually include the parameter dependence in the covariance. Yes. Uh, and I actually think that that is not self consistent because you're doing a Gaussian approximation to the power spectrum. At that point, you essentially, you know, the Gaussian mean is that the covariance is fixed. Uh, otherwise, it's not Gaussian. Um, so I think the correct way to do it is to include the parameters in the uh, mean dependence for the power spectrum. As usual parameters in the covariance, and if you find that those usual parameters aren't correct, you then update those usual parameters with a sufficient constant in making what that that I'm not sure if that explains your discrepancy, but it might because the really this really comes from the covariance dependence on the parameters. Uh, but I, I need to talk to you about that because that this is a very much similar problem that we're facing in other projects, you know, this CMB. Do I vary? determinant <laughs> as a function of nuisance parameters, right? That's exactly the same thing, so. Uh, yeah. Okay, we should probably really stop now and have the coffee breaks before the uh, next session. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>